So our last speaker is Dr. Tony Liu, who will be speaking on crowded body tumors. So that, guys. So, um, so this morning I'll be talking to you about carotid body tumors. Uh, they're a type of uh, paraganglioma, part of the paraganglion system, which is derived from neuroendocrine type tissues. Um, it can be really be found in the cervical, thoracic, or abdominal cavities, although they're predominantly found in the adrenal glands and they can involve either the sympathetic or parasympathetic systems. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, carotid body tumors are a subset of these paragangliomas and the most common type of paraganglioma found in the head and neck. It's found um, at the carotid bifurcation, the posterior medial aspect, and that's because that's where the carotid body is. The carotid body is um, neural crest cell derived. It's uh, about three to four, um, three to five millimeters in diameter, normally attached to bifurcation via Myers ligament. There's two types of cells um, that make up the carotid body that you can see on the histology slides here on um, screen right. Um, there's the chief cells, which are the neural crest cells and the supporting uh, sustentacular cells. Um, they form these little clumps that you can kind of appreciate better on this screen here um, with intervening vascular sinusoids. Now histologically, um, whether the malignant or the benign ones, and the majority of these um, tumors are benign, look the same. So their malignancy is, uh, and staging is really determined based on local invasion, recurrence, or metastasis to other tissues, commonly skin, liver, and lymph nodes. Um, back to the carotid body though, it's innervated by the nerve of herring, which is um, a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Blood supply primarily comes from the ascending pharyngeal um, artery, which is a branch of the external carotid artery. This is important if you're looking to embolize preoperatively, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and also for uh, control intraoperatively of bleeding. Uh, now again, it's a the carotid body is a cluster of chemoreceptor cells, so its function is to monitor for acidemia, hypoxia, and hypercapnia, and it uh, in turn uh, elicits a cardiovascular and respiratory response to compensate for that. Um, the majority of these are sporadic mutations, although there are some familial and syndromatic associations. These are rare findings, and most academic centers won't see more than one per year. Incidence is quoted between one to, uh, in 30 to one in 100,000 uh, patients, and because of that, there's a pretty wide breadth of um, laterality, malignancy, and um, incidence of synchronous lesions. Although in some studies, they said that uh, there's a two-to-one ratio of right-sided predominance, also a two-to-one ratio of uh, female-to-male incidence. One of the theories of why this happens is because, remember, there are chemoreceptor cells, so there's a chronic hypoxia theory. Patients who are living at high altitudes have um, cyanotic heart disease or chronic lung disease may experience hyperplasia of this uh, carotid body due to chronic hypoxia, leading to a neoplastic response. Um, the other theory is on a cellular and molecular level. I know this is not what you want to see at uh, 8 a.m. or so in the morning, but um, you know, on the cellular level, there's the idea that the defect is in the mitochondria, particularly in the succinate dehydrogenase gene, um, particularly subunit D. And this is, you know, we don't do genetic testing for this, but this is important in cases of familial um, findings or syndromatic findings, because sometimes there's synchronous lesions, there's a higher association of synchronous lesions in these patients, upwards of 40%, so you don't want to miss those if you encounter those. Um, in terms of the syndromes that it's associated with, you kind of see a list of some of them here, von Hippel-Lindau, MEN, neurofibromatosis, paraganglion, and pheochromocytoma syndrome. Um, most commonly, this is found incidentally as just a neck fullness or kind of a painless neck mass. Rarely you'll see that pulsatile mass there, um, and upwards of 20% because of these are uh, in upwards of 20%, because these are painless, some, uh, some people will come with you with kind of a hoarseness or just difficulty swallowing and dysphagia because it's gotten so big. Um, rarely you'll have a vasoactive tumor um, in uh, where you'd see refractory hypertension, and that's where you want to test preoperatively the urine and the plasma for the metanephrins and the catecholamines. Um, classically, it's described with Fontaine's sign where you have it's fixed vertically, but it's mobile horizontally. So that might be one of the keywords you see kind of on exams and everything. Um, with diagnosis, um, you really can diagnose this by angio, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and even some nuclear medicine tests. If you um, look on screen right here, I guess the mouse doesn't work. 
you're going to see on ultrasound, which is kind of the um, first line test for most, for most places where you'd go, you'd see this hypoechoic hypervascular um, mass on ultrasound. Um, on CT and MR, which you'll see, um, I'll show a couple of representative pictures in a little bit, um, it's good for operative planning and just kind of get to know how extensive that tumor is. Um, in cases where you have those familial or the syndromatic uh, occurrences, that's where um, the nuclear medicine studies like the octreotide scans and the PET scans really will come in handy more. Those are not really for normal uh, screening, but in those cases, remember the synchronous lesions I mentioned? This is what will help you find those synchronous lesions elsewhere in the body. So this is, kind of, this is kind of the representative MRI and CT scan. You kind of see the salt and pepper appearance on the MRI or the kind of heterogeneous appearance on that CTA on the right side of the screen there. And you can do your preoperative planning and see how extensive and involved it is. Um, on that note, you know, no talk about carotid body tumors would be complete without at least mention of the Shamblin classification system. It's uh, divided into one, two, and three based on how difficult it is it's going to be to resect that tumor. Uh, you know, type one, as you can see there, is just splays the bifurcation, gives you that classic goblet sign on um, angiogram, but doesn't really involve the um, external, internal, or the nerves. Um, with type two, you kind of get partial encasement of the external and internal um, carotid arteries, but the nerves are generally spared, making it a little bit more difficult, but not quite as difficult as type three, where you have complete encasement of the arteries and the nerves. And this is where you see kind of that quoted 40% incidence of cranial nerve injury with resections um, of these carotid body tumors. Um, preoperative evaluation, we kind of talked about the imaging a little bit. Um, angiogram has classically been described as the gold standard, but it's largely been replaced by CTA and MRI at this point because of the other advantages that I mentioned. You can have ENT evaluation. Um, if they've had some sort of uh, head and neck surgery before and you're worried about their vocal cords or you're considering a submandibular subluxation for a particularly high or large um, tumor. Uh, preoperative embolization we'll talk about a little bit more, but generally it's accepted for tumors three centimeters or bigger at this point. Um, and then if they're vasoactive, then think about preoperative alpha and beta adrenergic uh, blockades. The big thing to take away from this is that, you know, classically, don't biopsy, don't stick a needle in it. They're hypervascular tumors. It does, you can, you risk bleeding and you don't really help with the diagnosis by doing a biopsy. Um, so preoperative embolization, I think this is a topic that's talked about uh, quite a bit before and I think it's settled a little bit now. You can see on screen um, right, you know, these are pretty vascular tumors when you do an angiogram and on the bottom of those on slides C and D you see that it drastically kind of improves the vascularity uh, when you do these embolizations preoperatively. You know, when it's first introduced in the 1980s for the larger tumors, um, initial studies were very favorable, citing, you know, less blood loss, shorter OR time, less carotid clamp time, easier resections. Uh, you know, as it's explored a little bit more, as you would kind of expect with carotid interventions when you're putting a catheter up there, doing an angiogram, you start seeing um, perioperative complications associated with the embolization, so that kind of diminished the enthusiasm a little bit. More studies came about, you know, in this series of 33 embolizations, they really didn't have any um, perioperative complications of stroke associated with the embolization. Um, you know, in more recent studies, we've seen that, um, you know, these preoperative embolizations, when done within 24 to 48 hours before the procedure, they'll uh, decrease clamp times, decrease EBL. Uh, doesn't really make a difference in your rates of cranial nerve injury or OR time, though. Um, but does at least overall kind of seem to make the procedure a little bit simpler. Um, surgical technique for these, very, it's going to be pretty similar to your carotid interactory. You want your patient supine, head turned to the contralateral side, shoulder roll if you routinely do that. Um, one of the different things that you might want to think about a little bit more of these. Um, <coughs> And as opposed to your uh, interectomies is that you want to have the leg prepped out or at least have an idea of what the saphenous looks like in case you need to do an interposition or replacement. Um, so, oops. So this is incision with the patient supine, incision anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Um, you see the, if you go into a platysma, you see the tumor here, the bifurcation. Um, you want to get control of the common early on, so you have control in case you encounter bleeding. Some people at this point will get at least uh, loops around the um, internal and the external as well, just for control in that sense as well. Um, and then you want to start your dissection, usually with bovi or in sharp dissection, uh, sorry, with 
bipolar and sharp dissection at the carotid bifurcation. Um, this is going to be where it's most stuck, and it's one of the key points here is to make sure you don't take the adventitia off the vessels as you're taking the uh, tumor off, because that's going to actually be the easier plane because they're very stuck. But you don't want to de-adventitialize all your vessels and get them very, uh, get them extremely thin. Um, as you peel it off, you know, keep an eye out for the nerves and everything else. And you know, you want to make sure that if you encounter the ascending pharyngeal or large branches feeding this tumor, even with the embolization, that you start tying off these branches. And uh, in the end, it should look something like that, especially if you don't have to do an interposition. Um, you know, we're surgeons, so I started off with the surgical approach. The other ideas of this is, you know, observation. These are slow-growing uh, slow tumors, so for patients with a short life expectancy or elderly patients, it's not unreasonable to observe these patients. Um, and then the other is uh, radial therapy, um, mainly reserved for poor surgical candidates or recurrences. All right? Thank you, guys.